All right, today we're going to take a look at how a friendship between Pittsburgh Phil, the greatest horse better of all time, and a struggling jockey named Todd Sloan helped revolutionize the entire sport of horse racing the world over. Jockey Sloan rode his first race at Latonia Racetrack about five miles outside of Cincinnati, Ohio in 1886. He did not win his first race until three years later, he won a race in Louisiana in the year 1889. In his early days of riding, Sloan was known more for falling off of horses than he was for winning races. Um, here he is actually talking about the start of his career. You know, you see him here say, at least I had actually got a mountain race at New Orleans on Lovelace for the Beverwick stable, and I finished third. I rode in four other races at the same meeting, but didn't win any. I hated myself, for I didn't seem to improve at all. I may as well be frank about it. The truth is that I wasn't so bad until 1893 that I was a byword among trainers. They used to say that if a man didn't want his horse to win a race, he needn't have him pulled. All that he had to do was to send for Sloan. His riding would be handicap enough. Of course, I heard it all, and it didn't upset me as much as it might have done, for I knew I couldn't ride. Sloan continued, One little sentence, however, kept mysteriously ringing in my ears. You may be able to ride someday. Still, that was poor consolation, and as I was a thinking sort of kid, it hurt me some when the papers made fun of me. I should like to have a go for two or three of these newspaper men, but I bided my time without much hope, however. I just kept my tongue between my teeth and didn't talk so much then as I do now. But those papers, when By Holly signed me on the Bay District track at San Francisco, one race writer said that Holly must have engaged me because of the loud clothes I used to wear instead of any instead of for any merit I had as a rider. Sloan continued, it was the same old story. I tried and tried and seemed to get worse. I was growing older too, although I never grew up, and I really began to wonder whether it was worth going on with, and in 1894 I decided it wasn't. In thinking about what I should do after determining to give up riding forever, I made up my mind that I'd go on the stage. I looked about and actually had something in view. At that time, however, I had an unknown friend who took a good deal of interest in me. I found out about it afterwards. It was he who told me to stop all the nonsense about the stage and to go on trying to be a jockey. I shall always be grateful to him, Charlie Hanlon. Okay, meanwhile, we'll trans transition from Sloan and take a quick look at uh, the early beginnings for Pittsburgh Phil. You see here the story of Pittsburgh Phil, his real name, George E. Smith, and his eventual career has been rehashed over and over again, yet the relating of his wonderful luck never loses interest. He was employed by the Armstrong Cork Company, located on the banks of the Allegheny River at the foot of 23rd Street, in Pittsburgh. He was a frequenter of Price's Pool Room, then in operation on Fifth Avenue, a few days below or a few doors below the Grand Opera House, where he made only moderate wagers for a long time. He seemed to have excellent judgment and much luck in picking the winners. This was written in a daily racing form article in the year 1899. It's a funny thing how George Smith came to play the horses. As a young man, he was working in a cork factory in Pittsburgh for $8 a week. He dropped into Harry Price's pool room and bet a dollar or two on the baseball combinations, basically the baseball parlays. One day it was raining in three towns. There was no baseball games to bet on. Phil heard Harry Price selling an auction pool and invested $2 on a horse whose name began with O. The horse won and Phil begged $12, the biggest winning of his life. So he gave up baseball and began a remarkable career with horses. In a few years, he left Chicago at 93000 
He had never been on a racetrack. If there is any way to keep him from winning, no one has yet discovered it. Um, an interesting thing to note about Pittsburgh's, Pittsburgh Phil's name, his real name is George Smith, but when he went to Chicago, um, the bookmaking operation there, um, they, had a, they had a bunch of customers named George. They had other customers named Smith. So because his name was so common, um, he, he was from Pittsburgh. They gave him the name Pittsburgh, and they added Phil to it, which is short for Philadelphia, which are the two big uh, cities in the state of Pennsylvania. So that's how Pittsburgh Phil got the name uh, Pittsburgh Phil. All right, this Daily Racing Forum article here does a good job of, um, you know, kind of illustrating when Sloan and Pittsburgh Phil first met up here. It says, for some years considered a third-rate jockey, the star began to shine after he became a protege of the late George E. Smith, better known as Pittsburgh Phil. Uh, possessor of a marvelously light pair of hands, he had the first great requisite for a successful race rider. And when he fell into the hands of Smith, the closest observer that the American turf has ever known, he learned many things about horses which he had never noticed before or probably had not considered an essential to success in his profession. It was in California that Smith took Sloan under his wing, and those who were on the coast at that time tell of seeing the plunger. Plunger is another word for big gambler. So whenever you see uh, plunger, it's kind of old, old uh, uh, racetrack slang for big gambler. So it, we'll start again. It was in the coast. It was in California that Smith took Sloan under his wing, and those who were on the coast at the time tell of seeing the the plunger straddle a chair and go through the motions of riding a horse, talking earnestly the while to Sloan, who paid the strict, strictest attention to every word and movement of his mentor. Can, now, can you imagine that? I mean, just a, a, a gambler is straddling a chair, trying to show a, a professional jockey how to ride a horse. And I mean, what does that tell you about Pittsburgh Phil's reputation? <laughs> you know, as a better and the success he had, that a jockey would actually, you know, earnestly listen to that instead of, you know, either be offended or just think it was absurd. But it just goes to show you, you know, how um, how respectable Pittsburgh Phil was that uh, Sloan, you know, an intelligent jockey, but not a very successful jockey, was willing to, you know, pay attention to everything he was saying. Um, continuing along here, it says, um, you know, those in the East who had seen Sloan ride when he was in the employ of Walcott and Campbell and who thought him an indifferent horseman were amazed when they saw the change at Morris Park the following spring. When Pittsburgh Phil's horses and others ridden by Sloan won race after race, they could not understand the change. Um, how dramatic were the improvements that Sloan made as a jockey? Um, we'll take a look at his Hall of Fame bio here. Now, uh, the Hall of Fame, the Horse Racing Hall of Fame at Saratoga, you know, actually uh, started functioning in 1955. So this was the very first year that any, uh, you know, any horses or jockeys could be inducted, you know, any horses, jockeys, or trainers. And Todd Sloan, they, they only chose 10 uh, jockeys. For 1955, and he obviously was one of the 10 old-time jockeys uh, chosen in the Hall of Fame. So he was from the very first induction class of jockeys. Anyway, um, it says, although complete records are not available for his career, Sloan's winning percentage from 1896 to 1898. Now, I'll stop there for a second. The daily racing form was around for 1896, 1897, 1898. And there were chart books printed. So for those three years, they are complete records. But, you know, you go, you go when he wrote in like 1889, 1890, they did not have complete records then. But these three years here, there were complete records anyway, uh, were phenomenal. In 1896, he wrote nearly 30 percent winners, he wrote 37 percent winners in 1897 and 46 percent winners in 1898. In eight, 
During the year 1899, he won five races on three six-race cards. Uh, one card in New York, one card in California, one card in England. Um, so he, he goes to being a 46% jockey in America in 1898. And he, he Not only was he the top percentage jockey in America, but he was 40% in uh, England and absolutely set the world on fire in, in England. You know, the, the English wins here were at Newmarket. Um, so you see just this dramatic improvement from Sloan once he got hooked up with Pittsburgh Phil. Um, now, one of the major revolutionary changes that Sloan made to his riding style when he was in California with Pittsburgh Phil, you see here, this is, of course, is the 1890, the great 1890 match race between Salvador on the inside and on the outside, uh, Tenney. You see Ike Murphy here, it says he's in, you know, in the upright English style. So this is kind of what the English style look like. You know, they're coming to the wire here. Um, you know, he rides straight up in the air. Um, he, he beats uh, Snapper Garrison here, who's on Tenney. Um, you know, you see Snapper Garrison is in more of the American style. This is the English style here, straight up and down. He's in what is a high crouch, which is still, you know, long stirrups, very high, uh, very high up. But this is how jockeys rode um, you know, prior uh, to Todd Sloan's meteoric rise. You actually see a little better picture of it here. You know, you see Salvador on the inside, um, Tenny on the outside, straight up here, you know, a high crouch here. You know, this is from another uh, race in New York, a major race. You got two Hall of Fame horses here in a major race in New York in the 1890s. Look at how these jockeys, you know, are, are positioned and riding. It does not look anything really like a modern rider. I mean, it, it looks less shocking and absurd than it would be, you know, if you looked at the old English style where they're straight up in the air. But, um, you know, you, you see basically what the old style looked like here before uh, Todd Sloan, you know, through Pittsburgh, Phil revolutionized uh, the, the way they, the jockeys rode with what they called the monkey crouch position, you know, which is how jockeys ride now, essentially, um, you know, shorter stirrups, uh, monkey. Now, the, the monkey crouch, um, Pittsburgh Phil didn't invent the idea in his head, and Sloan, you know, Sloan gets all the credit for it because he was the first jockey who, you know, had made, had success using it, and he had so much success that it caused, it basically caused a copycat scenario where, you know, this guy was dominating, so everyone, you know, tried to, tried to, you know, ride more like him and, you know, copy uh, what was working for him. But um, it, this actually started, uh, the monkey crouch, um, which you see from modern riders today, you know, started with the Native Americans. And uh, Pittsburgh Phil observed a rider, um, they called him uh, Monkey Charlie or Charlie Monkey, uh, who, who he thought was a, uh, who he thought was getting horses. He was a Negro, a black rider, you know, they, they called it a Negro rider at the time. But he was a black rider who was getting, you know, a lot of run out of horses in the opinion of uh, Pittsburgh Phil. And so, you know, when he's straddling over a chair, trying to, you know, show Sloan, you know, how to position himself on a horse, um, that's not Pittsburgh Phil having any anything to do with being a rider he i mean he was obviously not he's not even a horseman he wasn't a trainer wasn't a jockey but he just noticed um you know how a kid was kind of riding under the radar and he in, in his opinion his handicapping opinion he was getting horses uh to improve just any horse that he would get on first time would improve that way so basically he tried to take uh sloan um you know, who was, who he must have thought was a, an okay jockey, but a good jockey for betting purposes because, you know, he, he didn't have a good reputation with the betters and the public. He wasn't winning a lot of races. Or, you know, Pittsburgh Phil thought, you know, he was probably smart and underrated. And he showed him, you know, the monkey crouch, um, which came from the Native Americans, um, you know, caught, caught Pittsburgh, Phil, Pittsburgh Phil's eye when a black rider was using it. 
kind of um, under the radar, but it has to do with wind resistance. That's a big part of it. Um, there were two other major things that Pittsburgh Phil, that you imagine Pittsburgh Phil talked, uh, you know, with Todd Sloan about. Sloan didn't directly credit Pittsburgh Phil for these things. Um, they actually had a, you know, a bit of a falling out. Um, the only, uh, the only female that uh, Pittsburgh Phil was ever with was an actress. Um, he was dating an actress, and Sloan actually, uh, you know, cheated on uh, cheated on the woman. Um, you know, cheated on Pittsburgh Phil's uh, woman. So, uh, but, but anyway, um, uh, besides the monkey crouch position, another thing that um, Sloan talked about is um, you know cover, what you call cover. You know, using other horses to break the wind for him. You know, he says, I find like like the cyclist that this renders the greatest assistance. No matter in what direction the wind is blowing, there is always some resistance because the horse goes much faster than it does. And therefore, I make myself as harmless as possible. And the other starters in the race become as useful as possible. Even if the leader drops back a length or so, I will still allow him to stay in front of me until the finish is close at hand. The closer you can be behind a horse or several horses in a long distance race, the better it is for you. I generally pull out at the right time and very few pockets are worked on me. So, I mean, this is just, you know, what we would call, you know, for modern racing is getting covered up, a good covered up position. You know, which is especially big in grass races. Um, you know, you've got the change from the monkey crouch. You've got an emphasis on cover. And another thing that Sloan um, emphasized, we'll, we'll get into now, is pace. How important pace is in a race. You see here, pace was another uh, big, big edge that Sloan had. He became a great judge of pace. I mean, he was known... That suddenly, you know, in America, but I mean, in, in when he went to England, it just went to another level. You see here, um, this from the London Sportsman. It was actually printed in the racing form, though. But uh, Todd Sloan taught riding lessons. The London Sportsman opined that English jockeys were all in a groove until the coming of Todd Sloan, who taught them by bitter experience that a race must be ridden all the way as a race and not merely in the last quarter. While he was teaching them, Sloan had things all his own way. But whether our jockeys are good or bad at the present time, they have at any rate learned Sloan's lesson, which is that a race is a race at every eighth of it, according to judgment. And that's whether you be riding, running, or rowing. Sloan won 28% his first year in England in 1897, and an amazing 40% of his races in England at the biggest circuits in 1898, you know, just the, the shock that it, it caused was just, you know, remarkable among, you know, he, here's an, another English turf writer talking about it. Suddenly on the scene appeared Sloan, the American jockey, being something quite different to what had been seen before in England. He was very properly ridiculed. Monkey on a stick was the favorite description of his attitude on a horse. The simile may not be inapt, but the monkey began to win races with extraordinary frequency. His seat was absurd because he could not control a horse, yet horses came straight through long distances for him. How could he use the whip in that position? He would fall off if he tried, yet he snatched races in the, final, in the last few strides, whip or no whip. When at Newmarket, he won five races off the reel. We were told his mounts were picked for him. Perhaps they were by that time, and with most excellent reason. Trainers had become tired of instructing picked mounts to jockeys who threw away a certainty through the overpowering attraction of the artistic finish, or from a contemptible ignorance of pace. In Sloan, they found a jockey who did not nullify the value of a good start by immediately pulling his mouth back to the others, but let it go smoothly on, who, if told that the horse he was best riding had been trained to encompass a mile and a half at its best pace, did not cover the first mile at a canter 
and so make a four furlong race of it, but raced all the way. By these simple tactics, uh, four furlong, no doubt, be a fine knowledge of pace. By these simple tactics, fortified, no doubt, by a fine knowledge of pace, he said it not the suggestion of picked mounts by winning easily, time after time, on animals that could make no kind of show with an English jockey up. It is now recognized that nothing could have been more favorable to the best interest of the turf than the advent of Sloan and the coming to England of his now considerable following. The character of our races has been completely altered, for when an American jockey is up, it is an unusual thing for the race not to be run true. Into the public, the American jockeys have instilled the greatest confidence, for with their own eyes, they can see them on every occasion trying to get first past the stick. The frequency with which they do this has become extraordinary. At Ascot, we saw them win 17 races out of 28, leaving only 11 to be divided among their numerous English rivals. Indeed, how successful was Sloan in, you know, his English adventure? Um, Fortune, okay, you see, he come back to ride a horse named Ballyhoo Bay in the futurity for William C. Whitney. He told an acquaintance in this country that he had more than $300,000 to his credit in England. Now imagine that, $300,000 in 1890s. as you know, quite a sum for the tattered stable boy who a few years ago, before smoked his big cigar as he sat upon a water bucket and played poker at Sheep's Head Bay. A king of England had complimented him upon his horsemanship, and he had been lionized by the biggest men of the English turf. It would be amazing if he had not been spoiled by the, all the adulation which came his way. The day when he committed the unfortunate mistake of bidding on a yearling when a representative of the king was in the ring, pushing his way through the press of nobility, cigar in mouth, was the beginning of his undoing. Then came the striking of a waiter with a champagne bottle at Ascot, and the revocation of his license as a rider. They gave no reasons for their ruling as a general thing in England. It is for the good of the turf, and that suffices. Nobody questioned the ruling, and those ruled against pass. They rarely come back. This is what the Earl of Durham, the legendary uh, English trainer George Lambden, had to say about Sloan during his time in England. He said, and this is in Lambden's opinion, it was Sloan's misfortune to be always surrounded by a crowd of the worst class of people that go racing. Once a man gets into that set, I have hardly ever known him to get out of it, even if he wants to. This was the ruin of Sloan and eventually brought about his downfall. He was a genius on a horse, off one erratic and foolish. He threw away a career that was full of the greatest promise. As jockeys in many ways, as a jockey in many ways, he reminded me of Fred Archer. He had the same wonderful hands and was quick as lightning to take advantage of any opportunity that occurred in a race. Like Archer, once he had been on the back of any horse, he had an almost uncanny intuition into its peculiarities and nature. This was the best story that the Duke had about Sloan. He talked about a time when he was uh, when Sloan complained he was too tired to ride. He said, I had engaged him to ride a two-year-old filly of Sir Horace somebody's in the next race. Bill Besherford came to me and said, Sloan has asked me to tell you he can't ride for you because he is so tired. I tried to get another jockey, but as there was a big field, I found everyone was engaged. So I went to Sloan and told him he must ride. With his funny American twang, he replied, That was the meanest horse I've ever ridden. I'm tired to death, and I can't ride anymore. But I insisted and weighed him out. When he came back into the paddock, he lay on his back in the grass, repeating, It's no use. I can't ride. Bobette, which was a beautiful little filly, was walking about close by. Sloan, still laying on his back, asked, Is that my horse? When I said yes, he was on his feet in a moment, and all his depression and lassitude disappeared. He won the race easily. Sloan was like that. When he was full of life and confidence, he could do anything. 
But when he was down, he could do nothing. Uh, Sloan and Smith, you know, they may not have had the, the greatest friendship as, you know, evidenced by, you know, Sloan moving in on Pittsburgh Phil's, um, you know, actress girlfriend, Daisy Dixon. Um, but th this is, these two guys are, you know, just a, a major part of what modern racing has become. Because, you know, through the monkey crouch, um, the entire world, basically after the success Sloan had, you know, in 1898, winning 46% in America, winning 40% in England, and, you know, dominating both American racing on the East and West and England all in the same year, um, you know, just created a copycat style. And it's the style of racing you see today. You don't see, you know, you don't see uh, people standing straight up. I mean, even the modern European style today, which where they, you know, ride a little different than here, um, would still be more like the monkey crouch than it would, uh, you know, the riding methods that were being used in the 1890s, um, you know, prior to Pittsburgh Phil and uh, Todd Sloan. Um, uh, Pittsburgh Phil died young. He died at age 42 in the year 1905. Uh, he had amassed, starting with $15, he had amassed a fortune of $3.25 million, uh, which, you know, adjusted for inflation in today's money, is worth close to $100 million. Um, you know, Pittsburgh, Bill, there, there was a mausoleum uh, built for him in the cemetery. The mausoleum is $10,000, and there's a statue. They had a $4,000 statue. You know, this was back in the early 1900s, Bill, you know, today, and he's got the racing form in hand, and he's facing the city of Pittsburgh. Um, it should be interesting to note the New York Times compared Pittsburgh Phil to J.P. Morgan. Uh, the, you know, just that's how influential he was in, in the racing world, just, a, a, just an all-time great gambler. Eleven years after the death of Pittsburgh Phil, a horse won the Kentucky Derby named George Smith. Obviously named after Pittsburgh Phil was the horse. He was named after Pittsburgh Phil um, because uh, the dam of the horse out, um, was actually owned by Pittsburgh Phil. So the owner, you know, as a tribute to him, named the horse George Smith. It won the 1916 Kentucky Derby the 42nd running of the Kentucky Derby, and Pittsburgh Phil died at the age of 42. So, you know, kind of an interesting coincidence there. Um, you know, one final thing to note is the book uh, that was written about Pittsburgh Phil's methods, you know, just a few years after he died. You can see here the 1908 book by Edward W. Cole, Racing Maxim and Methods of Pittsburgh Phil. George E. Smith, Th uh, 13 chapters it was, you know, just an uh, alarmingly good book. I mean, just even for a modern handicapper today, you know, this is a 110-year-old book. It's worth, you know, a, a read in so many aspects, just fascinating. A great chapter in there on drugs, too, and, how you know, how drugs were used in racing, um, you know, back 110 years ago. But, you know, you see here from the only personal interviewer ever get, ever given, you know, by the famous horseman. Uh, and an interesting thing about Edward W. Cole, he wrote this book in 1908. You know, he, he had his interview with Pittsburgh Phil. And after he um, after he he published this book, a very fascinating thing that, that I'll wrap this video up with. In 1910, it was Edward Cole who brought the starting gate, the invention of the starting gate uh, to, you know, New York racing. Now, again, Cole didn't, you know, Cole didn't invent the starting gate. It existed, you know, in other countries like Australia, uh, but Cole was the one who brought it to New York. You see here, origin of, origin of the starting gate. Well, much of the data is true. One person had more to do with a starting gate being introduced in the East and its installment than any other of those mentioned, and that was Edward W. Cole, then the turf editor of the Evening Telegram. 
It was he who could see the necessity of the gate, and it was he who cabled $100 to Australia to his brother to purchase the plans of the latest and most improved gate then in use in Australia. For the first meeting, the aqueduct gate was the only one used. It was a stationary affair. Mr. Cole releasing the barrier and Pettingale using a recall flag at his discretion. For the first year, there was much opposition to the use of the gate. Jockeys did not like it and did all possible things to have it kicked out. Owners, too, opposed it for the reason that their horses had not been educated to its use. And when Cole accidentally caught jockey Harry Griffin in the webbing, burning his neck badly, Major Belmont ordered it off the Morris Park track. But the foundation had been laid, however, and C.J. Fitzgerald and his brother-in-law, uh, Mr. McGinnis, decided to build a gate they thought would fill the bill, improving Orion patents by adding an electric release device. This gate is still in use by McGinnis and operated by both starters Dade and Morrissey in Kentucky and Canada. After the Morris Park incident and the accident to Harry Griffin, Mr. Cole severed his connection with the starting gate business. The battle for its control interfered too much with his editorial work, leaving the field to McGinnis through close. So that's basically it. So, I mean, you've got, um, you know, the, the great Pittsburgh field. You know, makes friends with a struggling jockey in Todd Sloan. Um, Todd Sloan's form as a jockey, just a magical form reversal. One of the greatest form reversals in the history of jockeys, you know, after he spends time in, in a Northern California with Pittsburgh Phil. He wins an astounding 30% in 1896, 37% in 1897, 46% in America in 1898 and goes over to England and dominates, dominates English racing, winning 40% there. You know, basically the whole world switches to the monkey crouch riding style. I mean, just took racing here and overseas, you know, by fire. You know, Pittsburgh Phil dies young, has a great, you know, leaves a great fortune. He started from nothing, a cork cutter, $15 to his name found racing by accident, you know, because his baseball parlay, there were games rained out, and he, you know, he happened to catch one of those lottery pools. So, you know, that's how it all worked out. You know, uh, Cole writes the great book about Pittsburgh, Phil, the, uh, you know, the 1908 book that's still around today, still easy to find. And he also, you know, kind of brings the starting gate to New York. I mean, you know, these are some pretty, pretty, pretty big in, inventions for modern racing. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't think about the way that unusual, you know, real odd style that jockeys use to ride horses. We, in the starting gate contraption, they come out of before the starting gate. You know, horses, the, the start would take forty-five minutes sometimes, sometimes over an hour. In major races like, you know, the the Kentucky Derby was once held up, you know, for over an hour by the start. Imagine it being a better and having horses standing around for an hour, you know, trying to get a fair start. When you do an act to start, a lot of times it's not a fair start. Look how Man of War was beaten in the 1919 Sanford Stakes at Saratoga. Half the field had no shot at the start and were left. Um, Man of War was practically turned around at the start in the Sanford, and he got off better than two other horses in the race. You know, if you look, read the chart, he was not the most disadvantaged uh, horse at the start in the race, and he was turned around. So, I mean, the starting gate, a big invention. You know, Pittsburgh Phil, obviously a great gambler. Todd Sloan, no other jockey in the history of American racing, as far as I know, had a greater meteoric rise than him. And, you know, it, did, it didn't end too well. I mean, uh, jockeys eventually, you know, caught up to his style, started mimicking his style and, you know, kind of Sloan went off the deep end a little bit. You know, he had an erratic personality. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I know it was a long one, but just take a closer look at some history in the fascinating Pittsburgh Bill.